My name is AJ Bloomquist. I'm a full-time broadcast engineer, a part-time graduate student, and a lifelong home cook. I'm used to being behind a camera for something like this. Being in front of one makes me a little uncomfortable. Hard boiled down. Opening read. Take one. Hi, my name is AJ Bloomquist. I'm 36 years old, married, and a home cook. Take two. I'm 36 years old, married, and I'm a home cook. I've always found solitude in this kitchen. Some of the first meals I've... Take three. Take four. Take five. Take six. Take seven. If there's one thing that makes a good cooking show host aside from their culinary skills, it's their personality. Many can be warm and inviting, relaxed even. Others are somewhat prickly, but they demand the best. Here, I'm trying to be warm and inviting while knowing what I'm doing. In reality, I'm feeling like a talking head who doesn't know squat. Hence my prickliness. Blah, 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 blah. As awkward as I may look on camera, I'm less awkward in real life and in the kitchen. I can confidently say my culinary skills are solid. My love for cooking started at a very young age, learning from my mother and her dad, my late grandfather. Both were primary cooks for their families. While my wife Katie and I share cooking duties, She's been the one who's helped broaden my knowledge in recent years. All three have provided me the foundation and inspiration to flourish in the kitchen. My original concept for Hard Boiled Down was to examine food-related issues while making complicated dishes. Surprisingly enough, you can't get any tougher than making smoked cheddar and donuts for a premiere episode. So the first thing I'm going to do is the smoked cheddar. Um, in this bag, I have an eight ounce brick of sharp cheddar cheese, a little bit of whiskey and a little bit of maple syrup. So it's gonna give it a nice little maple flavor to it. The big issue here is I don't have a smoker. Not many people who live in an urban environment like we do have a smoker. So I'm going to do the next best thing possible is actually I'm gonna do the stovetop version of this one. Um, it's literally nothing more than a big pot, a lid, and a steamer basket, which the cheese is gonna rest on. As for the smoke, it's just gonna be a little bit of uh, wood chips with a couple layers of tin foil. I'm gonna pause it right here. Look how much tin foil I'm using, just for the bottom layer. Primed myself for failure right from the start. Through the magic of editing and mental marination, I got it right a few days later. Same setup as before, but much smaller sheets of tin foil surrounding the wood chips. Coupled with a tighter fitting lid and patience with the heat, I got success. Trial and error in the kitchen is a great learning tool, especially for what I'm about to do in my next three episodes. But you'll have to tune in to find out what's getting smoked. Time to make the donuts. In this bowl, I've got a little bit of um, all-purpose flour. I'm gonna combine the rest of my dry ingredients here. I've got some baking powder, some cinnamon, some salt, and some uh, nutmeg. And here, I got a little bit of sugar. I'm gonna add some butter, it's been sitting out at room temperature, into here, and I'm going to fold this together to make it into like a whipped butter cream mixture. Um, usually, if you have your butter sitting in the fridge, you wanna leave it out for about a couple hours before trying to whip this, or if you have it in the freezer, two days. When you do mix this up, you kinda of wanna mix it up like it's scrambled eggs to a sense. I'm going to take this egg, I'm going to add it into the mixture. I'm also going to add the milk and the heavy cream. And beat this down to a creamy consistency. I added a splash of vanilla extract to my wet mixture before combining it with the dry. This is going to end up becoming a very, very thick dough. Man, they weren't kidding. This is almost flaky. Let's see, pretty thick. I need to take this dough, knead it out, and roll it into a uniform thickness. But it would rather hide in my whisk. While I take the time to pick the dough out, 
I've got something that's been picking at my mind. It's time for a knowledge drop. It makes sense that some of the most popular programming options in the world revolve around food. In 2010, a Harris Poll survey revealed that every other American watches cooking shows at least occasionally. Viewership was significantly stronger amongst the silent generation and baby boomers, yet weaker amongst Gen Xers and fringe millennials like myself. 46% of viewers who watch at least occasionally were men. The survey went on to highlight these programs inspired viewers to make a culinary-related purchase, ranging from appliances, gadgets, cookbooks, even ingredients. Some have even influenced viewers to visit a restaurant featured in an episode. Full disclosure, all the recipes featured in Hard Boiled Down's inaugural series came from restaurants that were featured in these programs Katie and I have watched, eventually visited, and purchased cookbooks from. What's crazy to me is an average person can spend more time watching, listening, reading, and scrolling through a never-ending buffet of food topics than in the actual kitchen making something. Chrissy Brady penned an article for the Huffington Post early in 2020 examining her hatred of cooking, but love for cooking shows. She provided four valid points behind this. Number one, vicarious consumption. Viewers watching the show can provide a greater satisfaction for a non-cook than the entire cooking process can be. Less calories are also consumed in this process. Number two, it fills a void. This is where how a non-cook's perceived love of cooking can be fulfilled through watching said cooking show. Number three, cooking shows can provide stress relief within a picturesque setting. And number four, cooking shows offer a general dose of inspiration to any viewer. One quote that stuck out from that article came from Brigham and Women's Hospital Associate Psychiatrist Ashwini Ned Carney on why we love them. I quote, What was articulated is that cooking shows are so riveting in spite of the person's hatred for cooking because it makes them believe in the possibility of what could be. Under normal circumstances, the possibility of what could be was limitless. Then came the coronavirus. Life as we knew it stopped dead in its tracks. Not only did it force many of us to cook at home for the first time in months, it also started to show severe cracks in the global food supply chain. Healthcare professionals and supermarket associates now share a common phrase, frontline workers. Many shuttered restaurants have become community-supported agriculture programs in order to support not only their businesses, but the farms that supply them. Those same farmers are trying to sell product directly to consumers to make a profit at least 30% of them fear they will go out of business by the end of 2020. Food programming has also changed as a result. Hannah Georges, a culture writer for The Atlantic, penned an article titled Foodie Culture as We Know It Is Over. In it, she notes that the coronavirus has shifted food media from an elitist viewpoint highlighting rare ingredients to an empathic approach to cooking with whatever we have in our pantries. The realities many of us now face at home requires that level of empathy. It's comforting to know that even the most noteworthy of culinary personalities out there are in the same boat as you or I. I agree with much of George's observations, but not with the title. I don't consider myself a foodie by any means, but I think food culture is evolving. The actions brought upon by the coronavirus has made me think about questions I have never pondered before. How can I become a better home cook? How can I contribute to long-term food sustainability? How can I be socially responsible through the food I eat? What relationship will I have with food going forward? How can I promote positive change to others through the power of food? The answer for every single one of those questions is I don't know, but I want to find them. It's thoughts like these that has turned hard boiled down into a lifelong project centered around my relationship with food. I'll leave it at that thought for now. I finally coax the dough into cooperating, but as for that stovetop smoker, not so much. This is not working out the way I thought it would. It's not gonna be perfect, but I'm gonna own it. Anytime Katie and I are in the kitchen, we have four rules we try to abide by. Rule number one, when trying a new recipe, stay faithful the first go around. This is a cardinal rule both of us follow when we find something new. If we like it and add it to our meal rotation, we'll tweak it to our liking. Some of these recipes I'm attempting in the first few episodes are extremely complicated and likely one-offs. 
but it's my goal to be as close as possible to the written word on the page. Number two, if deviation is required, put in the work to find something comparable. Some recipes require unique ingredients or a special piece of equipment, and there's an abundance of resources out there that can assist with any necessary tweaks. If you half-ass it, you end up with a half-ass result and look like a full one in the process. Rule number three, when improvising on the fly, be smart. This one doesn't need explanation, but I'm guilty of suffering from absences of intelligence at times. Take the non-working cooktop smoker, for instance. I tried doing this to get things kickstarted. Not the smartest thing in the world I've done, but there's been far worse. Finally, rule number four, own it. It's never going to look as good as the photo. I have a cousin who's a professional food photographer, and he can tell you one or two secrets on how they make those images look delectable. The hopes is it tastes just as good, if not better, than it looks. Okay, I've left you in suspense long enough with these donuts. I've divided up the dough into 12 equal portions. One half will go into a 400 degree oven for about 15 minutes. The other will get the traditional frying method in canola oil. Two minutes on one side, a quick flip, then two more minutes on another side. You're probably wondering why did I split up this batch? I was curious to see which method yielded better results. Okay, there's less than 10 seconds left on these donuts, both on the stove and in the oven. I'm gonna take the ones out of the stove top and the oil first. Oh, shit. You can tell I'm still learning. Hot. Sure. Maybe I should use something else. There are the ones from deep fry. And here are the baked versions. I think I know where these are gonna go get a quick cleanup. Let these donuts chill. These ones are gonna come out of their pan. Oh, they're partially cooked. They just don't have a golden brown finish on them. So, let's give them that. Since these donuts are pretty much cooked, I just want to give them a quick, crispy exterior. Throw them in the deep fry 30 seconds each side, pull them out, and get something similar to what the original deep fried donuts gave me. As for the smoked cheddar that went with this, let's just say You win some, you lose some. This is why I'm doing this. I'm making myself look like an idiot, but I'm learning in the process. This is gonna be the glaze for our donuts. A half cup of maple syrup, heat it over high heat. Once it starts getting to a boil, we're going to drop it down to simmer on low for five minutes, then we're gonna dip them. After a couple hours in the kitchen, doing things I've never done before, I can finally taste a sweet, sweet taste of victory. Quick dip of the donut on each side into the maple syrup, then onto a rack to let all the excess drain. Just like that, smoked cheddar and donuts. And my first episode in the books. All right, let's give this bad boy a try. Hmm. Magnifique. In all, my first crack at a straightforward recipe using a complex technique was a modest success. And my attempt at making a straightforward cooking show went up in smoke. This space will document my journey on changing my relationship with food and how these actions can lead to a better quality of life. I'm still going to try my hand at some pretty complicated meals at times, but I'm not going to be an authority figure on a culinary subject nor persuade you to do what I'm doing. I'm just one home cook taking a hard look at improving my part in the greater food landscape and boiling it down so future generations can benefit. Hopefully those who watch my progress come away thinking a little bit more about their own relationship with food and have fun with it in the process. Until next time, stay healthy and stay home.